everybody, Pete the Surferu down here in New South Wales now. We're at the Lismore Lantern Parade here with Suze. Hello, how are you? Hi, I'm good. This is going to be a huge event. Now we've rocked up pretty early, 10.30 in the morning. Jumper and Woolies. It's so cold up here, but quickly the sun set in. It's nice and warm now, so I've stripped down to my tea. It's all going off. Now tell us a bit about the event, what's happening here from around about 11 o'clock onwards for the rest of the day. From 11 o'clock, there is the Heartbeat stage, and that's been put together by uh, Anita at the Conservatorium of Music. Um, music all day from community participants, uh, students, professional bands, it's market delight, food stores, craft, there's a regeneration expo on, there's a kids art festival, and there's also a young people's teenagers art area. Well, wow, there's a lot of stuff happening. Thanks, now, before we go any further, normally this event is run in town, so it normally goes off. We've had to move out of here because of some different things happening through the year, but it's going to be a huge one. I heard you had used to get around about 37,000 people, sort of limited to the crowds at the moment. Very limited this year because of COVID, yep. so we're keeping it to a COVID oh, safe yeah. event. We'll have about 5,000 people, or 4,500 people yep. on site. Volunteers, there's 2,000 people walking in the lantern parade itself wow. and then about 3,000 people paid tickets coming on to enjoy. It's going to be huge. Now as we're looking at now some footage of actually everyone setting up the lantern parade. How many lanterns did you say there was roughly around about because do they come from all around Australia or just around this area? The lanterns come from mainly just this area. Okay. There'd be 500 lanterns in the wow. event at, at a guess and then uh, individuals can make their own mini lanterns in a triangle shape. Cool. So you get the big kind of character lanterns and then a lot of people walking with individual lanterns that they've decorated themselves. Wow. And I was going to ask you, this huge big thing behind me, what is that? This is our main fire image. You can see it's a flower, the petals will open Wow! and there'll be a bonfire lit in the middle. The whole thing is designed to, to, to burn, to go on flames and it's our finale final image. And then we've got the fireworks following that. Fireworks following. Wow, there's a lot to take in and of course I like when you said bonfire. It's been so long since I've actually seen a bonfire because I remember back when I was a kid we used to have bonfires in our backyard and we used to call a cracker night to let off the fireworks. You know, you, you're allowed to have that then but nowadays you're not allowed to have that. So everyone coming along is actually going to experience what a real bonfire is like and it's going to be a huge one too. It's going to be huge. Yep. Well guys, I hope you enjoy this big huge event here. The Lantern Festival here at Lismore. We're going to go out and check some more stuff. Check you soon, guys. Bye for now. Bye. Hi, Pete. I'm Ashley. I'm at the Lismore Lantern Parade. This is the SES boats, and it took about a month to make from scratch. Welcome back to Pete the Surfer. We're here with the Grand Mature Fashion Parade here with Angie. Now we're going to have a huge fashion parade here. I've never seen anything like it. It's all made here in Lismore at the Lantern Parade Festival and it's going off. Tell us a bit about it. Okay, so the, the idea behind the Green Couture Parade was to use recycled materials and create costumes, outfits, gowns, whatever you like to call it. We've got some beautiful outfits that have been made by Glow Mesh handbags that have been recycled. Wonderland, which was created using old bedspreads. My garbage bag dress, a newspaper dress, so all sorts of creations have been made. So. And how long has it taken to do some of these creations? Glow mesh bags would have taken Honeycut the Creator days and days. Have you seen some of these fashions actually taking off as a small individual thing here at Lismore going into the big fashions in Australia or overseas? Well my husband thinks that my gown is good enough to wear to the Our Kids Ball next year. So. Cool. That's good, that's good. That's <laughs> who good. knows? So who knows we might see some of these girls or some of these fashions in the big catwalks going overseas. Absolutely. Absolutely. In Milan or oh, maybe yes. wherever. Yes, yes. All self made here in Lismore. Aussie, Aussie all the way. Guys, check out this great vision of all these fashions made by the girls here in Lismore. Lantern Fashion Parade, Peter Surferu, and we're out of here to check out that big bonfire coming up soon. Yeah. Woohoohoo!
It's a VCR tape gown. So, you know, in the old VCR cassettes, it's the tapes that's in inside. At Mullumbimby Steiner School, and it was created by Rolf. Created using old seat belts, it was kindly sent to us by the Shearwater and Mullumbimby Steiner School by a previous student. Have a look at that. It's amazing. It's lovely and warm on a day like today as well. <laughs> Created by Tanya Von Deerhilt. It's a bubble suit which is made a bubble suit for our bubble world. It is a three piece outfit. There's pants, top, and cape which is showing us, and made with a full wondrous bubble wrap. Completely off bubble wrap. So it's, it's suitable for all occasions. It's made exclusively from recycled materials in Tanya's collection of packaging over the last 10 years of collecting. And she saved it from going into the landfill and made a beautiful outfit. To Kerry, um, welcome to Wonderland, an outfit inspired by the White Rabbit of the Mad Hatter. Uh, going to the New York Met Gala, constructed using recycled bed quilt and fur from discarded Sylvester the Cat performance costumes. Silver Tail Mermaid was created with uh, metal can lids. You can probably hear that clanking across the stage floor. Kindly lent to us by the Shearwater and Mullumbimby Steiner School, uh, designed and built by a previous student. The Silver Mermaid, and uh, takes some skill to wear as well. Mermaid tail, though, look at that. Beautiful. It's air created entirely from upcycled aluminium metal mesh from secondhand handbags. I don't think there's any handbags left. They've all been upcycled. Amazing. By Honeycut, Elements in Crisis. It's fire crafted from upcycled aluminium mesh yet again, uh, sourced from those secondhand handbags, which there's none left in the world, apparently. At least they've been put to good use. Well, they've, they've been put to good use yeah, down. They're not in our landfill, that's the main thing. Water created from upcycled aluminium metal mesh, again from those handbags. It's also using plastic ring tabs and plastic bags and debris that's been found on the ocean, on the seashore. The signs and symbols created by Honeycutt, and uh, it's called Extinction Rebellion. It's handcrafted from upcycled aluminium mesh sourced from those second hand bags. And just look at the design built into it. Fantastic. Frack off. If she turns around, no, <laughs> it won't. <laughs> <laughs> It's not the frack off one, but it's made by Honeycut and again made from that beautiful uh, mesh handbags, the glow mesh. Amazing to see that all that mesh is now being worn and constructed instead of going into our landfill. Amazing. The next one, again, is the glow mesh again, and it is Elements in Crisis. I can recognise this by the barcode. I didn't bring the scanner. <laughs> Use your phone. <laughs> It's upcycled aluminium metal from the, uh, the handbags again. And uh, we get used to seeing the barcodes everywhere. And here comes Frack Off Dress. If she turns around, we can read the writing on the back. Frack Off, made, from, made by Honeycutt and made from 100% aluminium mesh sourced from those second-hand handbags. Angela McCormick with one of her own designs straight out of the uh, the garbage bin. It's the black garbage bag dress, zip tie headpiece. And it's amazing what you can do, isn't it? It's it sure is. great. So if you can give Angela and all the models a big round of applause. You give them a huge round of applause. Amazing dresses. So a big applause for all the creators as well. Fantastic. Hours and hours of work have gone into making these. Amazing. So next time, instead of throwing your rubbish out, think what you can create to wear to your next special occasion. Or just to wear in general. Everyday outfits can be made. Seatbelts. A little bit of everything. The Green yeah. Couture Fashion Break. Give them a big hand, round of applause as they leave. Fantastic effort. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll see you in our garbage bin. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I get to put out the rubbish now, do I? Okay, thank oh, you. we're saving it now. <laughs> thank thank you. you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Hello, world. It's Dark Girl. This is Gonna Get Grubby. It's the story of us. Hey, guys.
guys and welcome back to Pete the Surfer. We're here with Scrap Boy from Dirt Girl World. G'day mate, how are you? I'm awesome. It's pretty good to be back on Bunchline Country here for the Lantern Parade and the Regent Expo. Couldn't complain? Cool mate. Now for all those viewers out there that aren't right into to kids programs, which I'm not, so give us a bit of a, a blurb about your company. I hear so many things. It's been going for 10 years. It was created off animation and now it's a reality and now you guys are going for it it's Australian production it's all here tell us about it so the original show that you may have seen if you were two or three ten years ago is Durka world looks like this Whoa! real animation and then a few years later we came into the real world as a slightly different show with the same characters called Get Grubby TV. That's when Costa Georgiatis or Costa the Garden Gnome yes. as we affectionately know him joined <laughs> our crew and now we're obviously able to get out into communities and hang out with kids and their families and talk about the way that we can all work together to create a healthier planet for the future. That's amazing and now you've got your little truck here which yep. I was just checking out amazing stuff so you can actually go out to location schools and whatever and do a telecast right there and then. Yeah, so we have put together a little live outside broadcast unit we call the Alpha Streamer. Yep. So the Alpha generation will be the largest generation on Earth. So bigger than your generation, bigger than mine. And they're all digital natives. Yes. So we thought, what a better way to connect with the Alpha generation than to get out there and use technology they're familiar with to talk about the things that are important to them. So That's we're great. about to head out into the northern New South Wales region, yep. visit a lot of the areas that were ravaged by bushfires in the January Right. fires That's good. and talk to them about how their communities are regenerating yep. and what changes are ahead for them so Mate, it's a really exciting time we're loving I, it I love that style because that's what I'm all about fitness health locations and reality what it really looks like out there not fabricating all the stuff mate congratulations another Aussie production going off here stick with it Pete the Surfer see you soon see ya. now. lentils called urud dal and it's often served as a breakfast in India. I find that it's very much suitable to the Lismo market because a lot of people here are vegetarian. We choose to make it using coconut oil instead of ghee. It is uh, vegan as well and it's really tasty. So it is served with a mixture of potato and vegetables filling. Oh, great, that looks so beautiful. Enjoy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mmm, beautiful. Thank you. Have a good night. This Mastala Dosa dish is really beautiful. Yeah, I recommend this. South Indian. This is Georgia Gray, and this song's called Happy End.
Thank you. Hi guys, I'm back here at the Lantern Festival here in Lismore. Pete, meet Pete. Hey, I'm, I'm good, Pete. How are you? <laughs> really good. Now tell us a bit about Sub Pod. Pod. Pete. Well, where do I start? I guess for anybody watching, if you're interested in composting, this is a great place to start. Subpod is an underground worm farm, so you're working with nature. It's about putting the worms in an environment underground where they can be in a cool, damp and dark environment. So you can feed them more uh, and you can feed more of a diversity of food scraps that you usually can't like citrus and dairy and onion. And it's just a great way to compost, grow food, help the planet all in one little thing. Sounds great. Now can we actually use these worms to put in with plants that like if we're going to plant some beetroot or beans and it's going to make the nutrients better for that plant? Absolutely. We actually have some beans right behind me and the whole dynamic of this is that the worms move out into the surrounding soil and provide those plants whether it be beetroot or beans and nutrients, nutrients and microorganisms. So it's about that relationship that exists between the compost and plants and putting them together. So just make a lot easier for you. Sounds really good. Now for those people out there in the big cities, they want to plant something, they don't need a big space to do it, they can have a little spot, but as long as they're doing it the right way with the compost and of course the right soils, mm -hmm. they can plant these plants and eat healthy. Exactly right. I think so many of us really depend on the supermarket for these leafy greens and herbs which are so easy to grow. And growing your own food can be really empowering. Just on my own adventure, growing your own herbs and veggies and picking it from the garden, putting it straight into a dish, feels really good. Great stuff. Super Pete here. Super Pete, fit and healthy <laughs> here too. All due to those green leafy vegetables and of course that's the way to do it here in Australia we can do it we definitely can Guys, welcome back we've got Costa Georgiaris here the gardener how are you mate very good Pete how are you really good now we talk... more. yeah I know it's a great place it's hey it's fantastic it's all happening we're great to get it back out into visiting people out here and of course yeah. getting events happening around here now you're all about nature all the goodness out there now before we go into bees which is one of your favorite subjects I want to get something clear here about organic food yep. now I go to a lot of pr produce and get organic food now is there really a difference between normal food you buy from Brisbane markets and then the, the people that come to the markets and sell organic food I think the thing that people need to think about is when you get to know your farmer it's not just about the food it's about how the food's been produced, mm. how that food is leaving the land where it's been grown, how extractive is it and how regenerative is it in terms of rebuilding the soil that it's come from. Right. And then of course on top of that you've got to think about the fact that locally grown food doesn't get transported long distances. That also means that the varieties don't need to be grown for a capacity to remain. A lot of them get picked green yes. so that they can be transported. So when we think about that in those terms, what we can then do by supporting local growers is we get varieties that have been grown, heirloom varieties that have been grown for taste, but they're not grown for transport. Mm -hmm. So you won't get them in the, in the broader scale agriculture. Yeah. So these are the little details that supporting your local farmers means because they're picked that day, you've got them that day, you know where they've come from and you build a relationship. Yes. Okay. When you know your farmer, mm. then you know what's in season, yep. you eat what's in season and that's better for you. And that's what I've noticed going to the markets. I've bought bananas from the big supermarkets and of course then I've bought them from a guy who gets it off the land and it's so sweet, the bananas, and they've got that taste you can't get from the big markets. Yeah, well, like anything, they have to be picked green to yep. be transported. So when something's grown on the tree yep. or on the bush and ripened on the bush, it means it's getting sugars right till the point that it's ready for you to eat. Yep, yep. But if it's picked green, it only ripens over time, yep. but the amount of sugar content is not going to increase. Mm. So these are the, they're the little nuances that yeah. supporting a local food system can, cool. can uh, help with. That's great info there. And, and 
and one more before I go to the bees, garlic. Now, there's a fallacy there. You get a garlic at the markets and it's growing inside a shoot. Throw it away, it's no good anymore. Is that true or false? Yeah, look, I suppose what happens is once something starts to turn from being um, static yes. to then growing, it's taking, it's drawing out of the garlic right. to grow a shoot. Okay. So that, that means it's reached a point where it's going to start to transform its taste and its flavour, yep. right? Still okay, yep. but ideally you want to you want to eat it when when it's when just no static. Shoot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good stuff. Now, moving on to the bees. Now, I didn't know this, but I was listening to your seminar over there. Bees. Guys, how many bees do you think there are? Like, I thought there'd be about one or two, and you said there's around about 2,000. Australian native bees. That, yeah. that is so, crazy. Like, yeah. 2,000 different varieties of bees. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And they're out there in different parts of the country in numbers, but because we're not conscious of it, we don't... We might see them, but we don't understand them, and yeah. we, we mistake them for flies, blowflies, wasps. European bees are not native. They are an introduced species. Wow. So the more we get to know our native bees, the more we can support and grow their habitat and look mm. after their habitat. And we do need bees for pollination, and of course, as we, some people are saying, the bees are going down now because of what's happening. Yep. Look, our native bees are... They... they they understand the landscape. Mm -hmm. They they're the right pollinators for our our native flora. Yep. And they're there when those plants need it. Mm. European bees are general foragers. They do the job. But there's more to our ecological equilibrium yep. than just European bees. Mm. Pollinators are not just European bees. Pollinators are native bees, moths, butterflies hoverflies, dragonflies, birds, marsupials. Wow, There's amazing. so many pollinators when we start to think about it. And when we think about that, then we can really start to understand how valuable any garden we plant is. Mm, that's so amazing the more stuff. we plant, then the more we support those those um, insects that support our ecosystems that protect the landscapes we live in. Very important information there, guys. And as you were saying up there on stage, guys, if you haven't experienced it, get in front of a flower, sit down for about, what, 20, 20 minutes, minutes, half an Join hour? Join the wild pollinator count. It's every, every uh, autumn and every spring. And contribute to citizen science. Bzzz. See you, guys. <laughs> that was him. Next time, The Lantern Show. Bye for now. Yeah.
Moscow.
bees, there's no one to mix the pollen in the flowers together. And all the fruit and vegetables won't grow properly. Bees get their food from the nectar and the pollen of flowering plants. Less flowers means less pollen means less honey. And according to these bees, there are less flowers at the moment. We need to plant more trees and plant more flowers so we can save the bees. So let's do it together. together.